Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today with you all. Thank you for taking the time to attend this talk. I hope that by the end of it, I've communicated some of, of why I'm so excited about this project. Um, I should say before we get started that I certainly certainly wouldn't be here without all the other folks listed here, the co-authors on, on the paper we recently released, as well as tons of folks from the, the Google quantum team and beyond who were really critical in making the experiments happen. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about this project. <laughs> I'm like trying to see you all, but the lights are too bright. I'll just give up on that. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about this project that we call it Unbiasing Fermionic Quantum Monte Carlo with a Quantum Computer. And I know that that title is a mouthful and, and we're going to break it down as we go. And like I said, I hope that by the end you're, you're as excited as I am about it. So, you know, what is it that I'm telling you about? Well, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about a new hybrid quantum classical algorithm for quantum chemistry, uh, an approach that's different from VQE and has different trade-offs. Um, and to validate this new approach, uh, I'm also going to tell you about the experiments that we did, including the largest quantum chemistry calculation performed on a quantum computer. Um, this slide, I'm sure, will be out of date soon. It could be already. It's, it's hard to say. The field is moving so fast. Um, but when we did it, it, it was the largest experiment, and we also were able to get very accurate data out. Um, and to be specific, um, and I'll circle back to the actual experiment at the end of the talk, but I just wanted to give some of the flavor. We looked at two carbon atoms in a diamond crystal. We did this experiment with 16 qubits and 162 qubit gates. Uh, and actually, we formally solved a problem that would take 56 qubits um, to represent in kind of the usual VQE way. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the juicy technical details that I'm going to skip over in favor of the big picture, but happy to take questions afterwards. Um, so this is, is what I'm going to tell you about. But you know, why do we need some kind of new approach? Well, uh, I'm showing you a graph here of the citations for the original VQE paper. This is the variational approach to quantum chemistry that we all know and love on these near-term devices. Uh, and you can see that the amount of effort kind of put into studying this thing, doing these experiments, addressing the challenges posed by using these noisy devices to, to study chemistry, um, the interest has exploded. We've had this exponential growth in the number of of work that the amount of work that people have done. Um, however, it's very challenging to scale these experiments larger, anywhere close to what is really challenging for classical, um, classical computers studying chemistry. Um, these are a list of a few of the largest experiments that have been done studying quantum chemistry on a quantum computer. Uh, this original experiment from the 2014 paper was two qubits. Um, we have very nice work on five or six qubits. Um, and then recently, we've gotten up to 10 and 12 qubits. But at the cost here um, of, of going to kind of a very simple model of chemistry that's it's efficient to treat classically, it's really a nice benchmarking problem. But, but we've been unable to push as a field very far beyond this because of the challenges of noise and optimization and sort of so many other things. Um, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with these experiments. In fact, they're just very difficult. And that's, that's the point that I want to make by putting them up here. And to get to this number to 50, there's quite a lot of work to do. So I'm going to say something controversial, hopefully, hopefully not too controversial. But you know, we really are going to need breakthroughs. And I don't think the plural is an accident there. We're going to need breakthroughs to do useful chemistry and material science. Um, this is an opinion, of course, but, but I think it's pretty well supported by, by the success in the field to date. Um, and so this is what, what motivated us to try something different to see if a different approach might, might offer us um, some more hope in, in these kind of noisy devices. Um, and that approach, again, we come back to this kind of mouthful of a title. Um, and maybe let's, let's start breaking it down. Let's start first with this Monte Carlo piece, not to be confused with the Monte Carlo Casino, although some of the folks who developed these algorithms back in the 40s and 50s allegedly had, had a gambling habit. Um, but these approaches are, are basically randomized algorithms. Um, there are many such algorithms, and, and they're very powerful tools that appear all over the place. Uh, and one of the reasons that they're so popular is that it's often very easy to either design these things or to run them, even when somehow directly solving the problem is, is unclear or is very challenging. I'm putting up a textbook example here where, without knowing much trigonometry, any calculus, 
uh, if you wanted to calculate the value of pi, you could design a very simple Monte Carlo algorithm that just relies on you being able to draw this square and this circle and, and sort of throw darts at them. So you could calculate pi this way without, without knowing anything more than high school geometry. Uh, this is just an example to say that these are algorithms have a lot of applications even when solving the problem might be quite challenging directly. So this is where we come to quantum Monte Carlo. Um, unsurprisingly, these are these kind of randomized algorithms for quantum problems. And here, the quantum problem that we're really focused on is the ground state problem. And specifically, I, I tell you, here's my molecule or here's my material. Uh, I'd like to know the ground state, maybe some properties, maybe the energy. Um, and the reason that this problem is really important is because the ground state energy and, and sort of things related to it determine a lot of the properties that we experience at room temperature. When we do chemistry, we look at a reaction. So we're always interested in, in sort of calculating something related to this ground state in quantum chemistry, or, or at least very frequently. Um, and you know, more specifically, what you might say you wanna do is you start with a molecule with some bunch of different energy levels. You start with an initial guess that has population in lots of them. It's, you know, it's just some, some guess you have and then you take some steps in your computation and you'd somehow like to project out all of these higher levels uh, and just end up with something very close to your ground state. Um, and this is very easy to write down, but it's, it's hard to do classically. Everything gets too large to write down or, or to store when you try to encode it on a computer. And so one might hope that these randomized algorithms are, are very successful. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but first, we need to take a detour through this word fermionic. Um, so what is a, a fermion? A fermion is, is a kind of particle. Many particles are fermions. And the important thing about them for our purposes uh, is that if you have a wave function of, of sort of lots of identical fermions, um, when you think about exchanging two of them, you shouldn't change anything, right? It's, they're identical, I said. You exchange them. There's no physical difference, but the wave function picks up a minus sign. Uh, and that minus sign is what leads to the famous Pauli exclusion principle, this idea that identical fermions can't pile up in the same state. Uh, and because of that, and the fact that electrons are fermions, um, that is, is basically why chemistry exists. Um, rather than piling up in these very simple states, like the electron in hydrogen or the ones in helium, you go to heavier and heavier elements, more and more electrons, they're forced to occupy these much richer variety of states. Um, this gives us chemistry, this gives us life itself in some ways. So that's it's a, a positive, but it, it also is like what makes studying chemistry with computers extremely challenging. Um, all this complexity makes our lives hard. Uh, and in particular, this minus sign that I mentioned is really going to haunt us. Um, and let me tell you where that, where that shows up. Um, so like I said, what we would really love to do is, is somehow just project exactly. We have some estimate of the ground state energy as we advance in our computation, and we'd love to just get to the correct answer. Um, but we, you know, I said we can't do that. We can't even write down the objects we would need directly, completely. So we use one of these randomized algorithms that oftentimes are very good in situations like this. Uh, but here we run into a problem. Um, and what happens is that we have these random steps. We also have these minus signs coming in um, from the, the fact that electrons are fermions. Uh, and we start to randomly accumulate positive and negative weights. And you, you imagine averaging these things together. Uh, and the signal that you're looking for gets dwarfed by the noise from this, these positive and negative calculations. Uh, and the computational procedure starts to look hopeless. You get crazy answers out, or meaningless answers. Uh, and this is what people mean when they, they say there's a fermion sign problem. Um, of course, this isn't the end of the story or, or we could go home and, and I wouldn't be giving you this talk. Um, there is a really nice strategy people have developed for getting around this. Uh, and this is really key. So if this is, is basically where we're gonna intervene with the quantum computer. So I wanna slow down here. Um, and what we can do is we can avoid this sign problem using what we call a trial wave function, which is basically some kind of crude approximation to the ground state. It doesn't have to be very good usually, but it's something that approximates the ground state. And we use it to bias this random algorithm and avoid this 
sort of catastrophic cancellation. Um, classically, we take very simple approximations and we can get reasonable results out. This is why this is a powerful method absent quantum computing. Um, however, you also, you inevitably kind of bias the results that, that come out. And sometimes this isn't a problem, but oftentimes it prevents us from getting the kind of accuracy we would like. And we're in this sort of cartoon here where we're getting something, but it's just not quite right. Uh, and this is where the first word in the title comes in. We can try to unbias these results by improving the trial wave function. If we use a trial wave function, remember just some approximation to the ground state, if we make it a little bit better, then we have less bias. Um, and that, that's really what we'd like. We'd like to get a very accurate answer. Uh, and this is what we do. This is where we looked at this algorithm that people really use classically. We say, look, it's very hard to improve these trial wave functions in an efficient way classically. We're limited by what we can do. But the kind of calculation that we use these for, the, the subroutine in these algorithms, is actually very natural for a quantum computer. Um, and so quantum computers are going to let us use better trial wave functions. This is the role of the device in our algorithm. It provides a better approximation to the ground state than, than we'd have available classically um, when we're wanting to compute these particular things that, that we need. Um, so we have many choices, like lot, you know, lots of people here, in many of the talks I'm sure that you've seen, a lot of the work on quantum chemistry is about approximating ground states with a quantum computer. Um, and so even when you can't do it perfectly, these might make very good trial wave functions. And then the thing that we need to calculate for the technical folks in the audience is just the overlap or the inner product between that wave function we can prepare and, and some other very simple things that, that come up in the course of our computation. So the circuits are quite simple. There's easy ways to do this calculation. There's also hard ways. We took a hard way for technical reasons I won't have time to tell you about. Um, but it, it's a very natural thing to use a quantum computer for. Um, and it, this is exactly what we did. We said, look, we know we can prepare a decent approximation to a ground state, even on a noisy quantum computer. Um, and this is a circuit that we actually used for our, our sort of eight qubit experiment, where we do something that prepares the trial wave function in this block, actually a, a superposition of that and, and some reference state. But so this basically gives us our trial wave function, which is an approximation again to the ground state. Uh, we have some post-processing that conceptually you could say it belongs here, but, but don't worry about that part. Uh, and then we prepare that and we use this really nice technology uh, called shadow tomography that uh, I really love. I'm, I'm not gonna have a chance to dig into why I'm excited about it other than to tell you what it lets us do. Uh, and in this experiment, what it lets us do is prepare our trial wave function, make some kind of randomized measurement, uh, and we just repeat that process a bunch of times. And we do all of this before we're thinking about our Monte Carlo calculation, and we collect that data, and then we send it in a package to our classical computer, and it can use it to drive the classical algorithm. So there's not some kind of complicated feedback loop in this case, and that made our experiment quite a bit easier. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is the situation that we're in. We, we run this thing, we collect this data, we feed it to our Monte Carlo algorithm, and then it, it takes like a supercomputer, you know, a few hours, and we're sitting there, we're waiting and wondering, is this actually going to work? Uh, and what happened is that, in fact, it did work very well. Um, I'm jumping right to the 12 and 16 qubit data um, rather than looking at the eight qubit stuff because I, I think it's more interesting and I won't even have time to tell you about all of the little figure, all the little dots on here, but I'm just gonna tell you what I love the most about these results and what got me really excited. Uh, and that really is that if you look at these blue points, you can see here, uh, this is looking at a 12 qubit approximation to a nitrogen molecule. We're looking at different, sort of stretching it to different degrees and seeing you know, what is the energy of that, of that molecule. Um, and, and you can see there's a black curve here, which is the exact answer. And then wildly far away are these blue dots. And those are the energy of the wave function that we got out of the quantum computer on its own. It has like qualitatively the right character. There's a dip there, but it's a, a bad approximation to the ground state in some sense. Um, but if we take that and we feed it in to, and use it to drive our Monte Carlo algorithm, 
Instead, we get these red points, which are almost exact on this scale. And in fact, we have to zoom in and, and just plot the error to see, um, to see any deviation from the exact answer. And we find that those red points are almost all, well, two of them are sort of on the border, but they're within this narrow band that we call chemical accuracy, which is, is kind of an arbitrarily chosen threshold, but it's some very tight threshold that tells us approximately how well we need to do to get very detailed chemical properties. So this, is, this was our goalpost, uh, and we're basically there um, for this toy example. We're also beating these yellow points and these green points, which are, are classical, very sophisticated classical methods that seem like a fair comparison. Um, of course, the problem is, is small enough that we can solve it exactly, but we were really encouraged to see these results. Um, when we look at the 16 qubit diamond, uh, we're a little bit worse, but we see something similar where we're beating these classical methods that we compare against, um, including these yellow points, which are this same method, but with a classically tractable trial wave function. So we're, we're, maybe we're tying that. You could say we're beating it in some sense, at least we are here. Um, so that was encouraging. And then the other thing that, that was exciting is that if you look at the red points and the black points, they're nearly on top of each other. And that's really interesting because these black points are what we would get by using an ideal, perfect, noiseless quantum computer with an unlimited measurement budget to carry out this same experiment. Um, and the fact that we are so close to that is telling us that we're not yet limited by noise. In fact, we just didn't pick a good enough circuit to begin with. And so we have room to push this kind of method even further. Um, and that, yeah, that was really the most, the most exciting thing about this to me because it, it says that, hey, you know, are we gonna have, be able to get to 80 qubits and do some interesting chemical problem? That seems really hard. But we can push this further than we have um, and we're already at, at quite a large model problem here. Um, so I think that that's all I wanted to share with you about the work. I encourage you if you're interested to, to look at the paper we tried to write it for a broad audience. Um, I would love feedback if we failed at that, but hopefully um, it's digestible. Um, and also, you know, in that we, we go into some more detail about what are the challenges we faced. I gave you all of the things we're excited about, but there's also some real challenges um, facing extending this kind of method. Um, but with that, I'll just say thank you so much for your kind attention. Um, I'm being herded off stage potentially. Nope, I got some time, great. Um, well then, just a quick shout out as well. Our team is growing and we would love to see some of the faces I can, I can barely make out um, in calls like this in the future. So I'd, I'd love to use the remaining time to take any questions that folks have. We have a mic over here. Uh, if you don't mind, come over and uh, you can ask your questions. I saw some hands raised over here. Okay. Uh, do we have any chance to utilize your software by uh, hiring it? Um, that is a great question. Right now, it doesn't seem ready to solve business problems. Um, it's still like a, a sort of research question, like how can we solve the remaining challenges? Um, but you do have a chance, uh, you will have a chance shortly to use our software that we're gonna release an open source version of this that integrates the kind of sophisticated classical calculations we did with, with this kind of experiment. Um, and hopefully we were able to even release the raw data that we collected so one could try tweaks against it. Um, and I, I certainly would love to talk with folks who are interested in, in following up on it. Um, I have to admit that I'm a bad software engineer. Somehow I got hired at Google despite that. Uh, so we're having, you know, we're rewriting it to be like really useful and flexible, but but at least to that extent, you'd have, have the ability to use it. Thank you very much. You have another question? Yes. Yeah. Um, can you explain again how uh, the noise is not a problem at the end? Yeah, so um, you might hope that it wouldn't be uh, because of, of sort of what I said about the role of the trial wave function, which is that it's just introducing some bias to the, um, to the classical algorithm. It doesn't have to be perfect. We know from classical calculations that even a, a crude approximation can be, be quite good. 
Um, there is another technical thing, which I, I didn't mention here, which is that uh, ultimately the input to the classical algorithm is a ratio of two different quantities, these different overlaps we calculate. And at least simple kinds of noise, just rescale those both in the same way. So it, then when you take the ratio, then that impact disappears. So there's, we had some reason going in to think it, that would work well. And, and just generally, these Monte Carlo algorithms are, are pretty resilient to additional sources of noise. But uh, also, to some extent, it, it would be great to understand better you know, what the answer to that question is. Like, why, why exactly is it? Does it work? And when would it break down? What makes a good trial wave function? Is it that the total structure of the wave function or that the density is more or less correct? Um, that's a good question. So there's, there's various flavors of Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo. And in some of them, you may be thinking of diffusion Monte Carlo, where you have this pretty clear picture of like exactly what is the algorithm doing. Um, where it, it's looking at the nodal structure, like where is the wave function positive and negative, and it's doing some optimization kind of within the space of similar wave functions. Uh, to my understanding, the flavor of Monte Carlo that we use, this auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo, is kind of inspired by that, but it doesn't have the same really clear picture. And so it is less obvious to me when it, I mean, when it, when it works, it, it's good, but like, what's a better answer than that? I mean, we know if it is very close to the ground state, it's also must, must be a good trial wave function, but once you start making the approximation poor, I'm not sure I could tell you ahead of time sort of when it, it would be useful or not. There are some diagnostics one can do with these kind of methods to see, like, is it, is it working properly? Um, which I could, we could talk about offline if you're interested in, but that's a great question and I wish I knew the answer. I think there was one more question. Uh, yeah, I just, want to, I just want to be sure about uh, whether you implement those kind of uh, calculations in your quantum computer. So what we did uh, in which they have uh, in which it has uh, 160 qubits. Yeah. So we um, on the quantum computer, the largest thing we did was this 16 qubit experiment. And normally, when you're treating these kind of quantum chemistry problems, it's reasonable to identify a smaller active space where the most of the quantum correlation is happening, and then you can sort of think of the rest of the molecule, the rest of the space is like, there's some important effects there, but one can try to correct for it with lower level methods or like perturbation theory or something. Um, and that can be expensive, that can be cheap. Uh, one of the really nice things about the way this kind of approach works is that we can do the active space calculation on the quantum computer with say 12, 16 qubits. And then we can very affordably do the classical calculation in this much larger space. And so the data I'm comparing against is the exact answer in these larger spaces, but we only had to use the quantum computer to look at the quantities in the active space, and then they got fed into the classical algorithm. So yes and no, I guess it depends what you mean. But yeah, I'd be happy to chat more about it offline. All right, well, let's thank William once more.